Hi everyone, this is Kim Alia, and welcome to a special first part session on acid remedies. Kim Alia on acid remedies. And uh, I'd like to thank everybody who's on the call uh, today and also a special thank you to Penny Edwards who helped to organize uh, this call and who will also be available to moderate and interface with the participants. So you'll notice that you've got a control panel on the right hand side of your screen and if you open up that control panel you'll see there's a number of tabs. One of them says questions and uh, feel free to type in any questions into that little area there. Uh, we'll be reviewing uh, uh, some cases. Uh, we'll do as many cases as time permits. And I will definitely want your participation uh, during those cases. I'd love to get uh, your suggestions on uh, important symptoms or important ideas or whatever else. You know, we can have a dialogue about it. And then eventually, of course, I want uh, suggestions on remedies as well. So the uh, subject for today's presentation, uh, Penny, can I ask that you mute yourself out so that it's, it's less noisy? Mm -hmm. You click on the microphone to the left of your name, and that way you can unmute yourself whenever you want. Great, thank you, Penny. So, uh, so the, the topic for today's presentation is acid remedies. In other words, remedies that we consider to be acids, uh, things like sulfuricum acidum and nitricum acidum and phosphoricum acidum and acetum acidum, and there are many different types of acid remedies. And so the first question that pops into my mind, of course, is the validity of studying remedies as a grouping, you know, you know, studying the Solanacea or the Primulaceae or the Scrofularacea. Uh, and, you know, I oftentimes ask my students, you know, did Hahnemann ever talk about such a thing? And most of them actually don't know that Hahnemann actually did discuss the subject in an essay that he wrote in 1796 called Search for a New Principle. And in that particular essay, he asks the, the Socratic question, uh, can we infer a similarity of action from botanical affinity? Here's what he wrote. He said, perhaps, however, botanical affinity may allow us to infer a similarity of action. So he's asking the Socratic question, maybe plants and maybe remedies that came from the same botanical grouping will have the similar medicinal effect. And then he answers his question by saying this is far from being the case as there are many examples of opposite or at least very different powers in one and the same family of plants and that in most of them. So what he's saying here is that no, we really can't uh, say that plants in the same botanical grouping necessarily have the same medicinal effect because sometimes they have very different and sometimes even opposite medicinal properties. But he then goes on to say that, however, I'm far from denying the many important hints the natural system may afford to the philosophical student of the Materia Medica and to him who feels it is his duty to discover new medicinal agents. But these hints can only help to confirm and serve as a commentary to facts already known or in the case of untried plants, they may give rise to hypothetical conjectures, which are, however, far from approaching even to probability. So what he's saying here is that, listen, you know, I'm not going to deny sometimes, you know, plants in the same botanical grouping may be similar. And, you know, if you're a philosophical student of the Materia Medica and you want to study these things, you can go ahead and do it. And, you know, maybe they'll give you some hints that might be of interest, Interest, but be careful. You know, these, these are only hints that can confirm and serve as commentary to facts already known. And what he means by facts already known are remedies that have been approving conducted on them. And in aphorism 108 of the organ on Hanum is very clear that the only reliable way to know about the medicinal properties of a substance is to conduct a proving on them. And so he says, okay, you know, maybe we can know these things, but this can only help to confirm uh, as commentary to facts already known. In other words, to plants that have already been done approving on them 
uh, or in the case of untried plants, ones that have not been proven, they may give rise to hypothetical conjectures, which are, however, far from approaching even to probability. So he says, again, you got to be really careful because even if they're in the same botanical family, that doesn't necessarily mean that they have the same or similar medicinal properties. And then in his uh, Materia Medica Pura, under uh, the description of Ignatia, he writes its positive effects, he's talking about Ignatia here, have a great resemblance to those of Nux vomica, which indeed might be inferred from the botanical relationship of these two plants. So here, interestingly enough, he's saying that you could have determined that Ignatia and Nux vomica were similar, they're both in the Loganacea family, that they're similar because they're in the same botanical family. So Hahnemann isn't denying that sometimes plants in the same botanical family have similar medicinal properties. He's saying, yes, sometimes they do, but he's saying you gotta be careful, sometimes they don't. So sometimes they do and sometimes they don't. Now Herring, um, interestingly enough, in his article on the study of Materia Medica, actually says that uh, remedies that come from a similar source must be similar in their medicinal effects, which is a little bit different than what Hahnemann is saying. Hahnemann is saying that sometimes they're similar and sometimes they're not. Herring is saying that if they come from a similar source, then their medicinal effects must be similar. And he goes on to say that really it's only those remedies that come from a similar source that will be similar in their most important qualities. Now, Jan Scholten, in his book called Homeopathy in Minerals, writes that it is the first book in which we look at the remedies from a more abstract point of view than before. The abstraction is not that we go deep into the theme of one particular remedy, but that we go deep into the theme of a group of remedies. This abstraction even makes it possible to predict, to a certain extent, the picture of unknown remedies. So what Scholten is saying here in his book, Homeopathy and Minerals, is that we're not studying individual remedies, but we're abstracting and studying a group of remedies which share some type of similar medicinal property. And this group might be a group that we find in botanical groupings like the Solanacea or the Primulaceae or the Scrofularacea or the Apiaceae or any other botanical grouping, or it could be a zoological grouping like the Araneae or the Serpentis or the Animalia or Mammalia or any other zoological grouping that we find in nature, or it could be a grouping within the periodic table. It could be a stage or series within the periodic table. That could consist of a grouping of remedies, or it could be a miasmatic grouping, some way by which we group of, of remedies together and say that these remedies are grouped together, and not only are they grouped together because they have some similar chemical or taxonomical grouping, but they're also similar in their medicinal effects as well. Continuing in Homeopathy and Minerals, Scholten writes that the group analysis is the least successful on the level of local complaints. Some general guidelines may be given, but there are very few specific symptoms that stand out. On the level of general characteristics, group analysis can be applied very well. The group analysis has appeared to give the best results with the mind pictures of the remedies. So what Shulton is saying here is that it's gonna be the more general symptoms, things like weakness, anger, anxiety, fear, which will be most easily applied across a group. More specific symptoms, more local, more particular symptoms will less be inclined to be found across a particular grouping. And he also emphasized that these group symptoms will best be seen at the level of the mind symptoms of the remedies. Now, we've got to contrast that with aphorism 153 of the Organon, where Hahnemann writes that in the search for a homeopathically specific remedy, the more striking, exceptional, unusual, and odd characteristic signs and symptoms of the disease case are to be especially and almost solely kept in view, 
these above all must correspond to very similar ones in the symptom set of the medicine sought if it is to be the most fitting one for the cure. The more common and indeterminate symptoms, lack of appetite, headache, lassitude, restless sleep, discomfort, etc., are to be seen with almost every disease and medicine and thus deserve little attention unless they are most closely characterized. So what Hahnemann is saying here in aphorism 153 is that the most important symptoms are the striking, strange, exceptional, unusual, characteristic signs and symptoms of the disease, and the more general symptoms such as weakness, headache, uh, anger, fear, anxiety, are, have little to no value unless they're qualified by modalities. So remember, those symptoms that Schulten says are most likely to be found across a group are the ones that Hahnemann says are least useful in actual practice. Not to say that they have no utility or no usefulness, but in terms of their ability to help us narrow down their choices, they're going to be less useful. So when you look, for example, at a grouping like the acid remedies, you will find certain things that run across these remedies, like weakness. Weakness is generally speaking found across almost all the acid remedies. However, a floricum acidum, is a remedy which is actually quite strong. If you inject fluoric acid into the muscle tissue of an animal, it will actually increase the muscular strength of that animal. So here's an instance where at least in the case of fluoricum acidum, it's the opposite of what we generally expect to see in the acid remedies. Also in general, the acid remedies as a group tend to be very chilly. But again, we find that fluoricum acidum for whatever reason, uh, tends to be a warm remedy. Uh, and it's one of the few of the acid remedies that we really find to be hot. Almost all the other ones tend to be quite chilly. So again, even though in general they tend to be cold and chilly, we do find an exception in the case of fluoricum acidum. We find that the discharges in the acid remedies tend to be burning. Uh, of course, there are many other groups of remedies which have burning discharges, not just the acid remedies, but it is a quality that we find running across this particular group. And we find that the discharges tend to be thin, offensive, and acrid. And that, in general, tends to run across the, uh, the, the acid remedies in general. And then you tend to find a lot of destructive tendencies or destructive processes running across of the board in these remedies. So you find things like weakness, destruction, burning tendencies, thin discharges, acrid discharges, offensive discharges, a tendency towards weakness and um, chilliness uh, with the exception of fluoricum acidum. So there are some general qualities that we will find running across these remedies, but you know, you find many other groups of remedies which could also be have these particular qualities as well. So although they may help you to think uh, that this might be an acid remedy, again, uh, it wouldn't necessarily in and of itself narrow down your choices and say, ah, I definitely need an acid remedy in this particular situation. The acid remedies will be a group of remedies that you'll find in more people who tend to be sicker. Uh, not always, but in general, they tend to be more destructive in their nature. Uh, so people who are very sick, who are who are who are uh, bedridden, who are in hospitals, you know, then you think of remedies like hydrocyanic acid and nitricum acidum and fluoricum acid. And people who are very sick with bed sores and uh, very very end stage processes, and we'll be thinking of these types of remedies in those types of circumstances. Okay, so that's just a, a quick introduction uh, into the acid remedies. Uh, let's go ahead now and do a case. Uh, again, I just want to reiterate, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to type them into the question uh, box, and either Penny or myself will be happy to answer any questions that you might have. I don't know, Penny, if any, anybody has any comments or questions so far, they're welcome to type them in, and um, Penny would be happy to field them and relay them to me. I see there's no questions yet, so let's go ahead and uh, let's do our very first case. All right, and so this is a case entitled Nicholas, eight-year-old boy with behavioral problems. And I'll, what I'll do is I'll read through the case and you know, please go ahead and write down any symptoms which you think are important or any important ideas that you think should be found in whatever remedy is prescribed. You know, to the degree that you can make suggestions is the degree that I can, you know, address uh, thoughts that you might have and, and give you ideas about why I'm, I think that that might not be, uh, you know, the best choice or might be a good choice or whatever. But if I can have a dialogue, I think that that's really the best way to, to make the most of these types of cases. 
All right, so Nicholas was uh, brought in uh, to see me because of extremely aggressive behavior associated with emotional and social problems. Nicholas has difficulty making friends at school and tends to avoid making eye contact with people outside of his family. He's especially shy when meeting new people. In addition, Nicholas has had a difficult time learning how to read and has been diagnosed with dyslexia and other learning disabilities. Uh, during the intake, Nicholas repeatedly speaks over his parents as if he does not even consider their presence in the room to be important. In addition to the verbal insensitivity, he repeatedly pushes and grabs both the parents when they are speaking with me. Uh, the parents tell me that uh, at school or home, there are times when he can become extremely aggressive. He will punch, kick, and even choke his classmates as well as young, his younger sister and older brother. And the aggressive behavior will usually express itself when he is not being paid attention to. Nicholas is also very stubborn and will scream and throw a temper tantrum when he does not get his way. He always has to be the center of attention and if the parents give either of his siblings any attention, he will lose his self-control and will go into a rage which can last for hours. He needs a great deal of approval from his parents and constantly asks them questions like, am I doing this right? Uh, the aggressive behavior started when he was three years old after his sister was born. After the birth of the sister, he became very needy and could not be left alone. If his parents would leave the room for a few minutes, he would begin to scream and cry. When he was younger, he was extremely insecure and would always cling to his parents. He needed to be held constantly. As soon as you would put him down, he would start to cry. His fear of being left alone is better, but at night he can still become very insecure. Either his mother or father must stay with him until he falls asleep. Even now, if he wakes up in the middle of the night, he will start to cry and will need for one of his parents to comfort him until he falls back asleep. In general, his sleep is very restless. He will squirm, moan, move his head from side to side and flail his arms and legs. He also grinds his teeth at night and has offensive perspiration. His pillow is frequently wet from saliva. The start of school was very difficult for him. It took him almost the first year of kindergarten before he could be left alone without crying. The markedly aggressive behavior started sometime during first grade. If the teacher was paying attention to another student, he would become agitated. Eventually, he became physically violent toward his classmates. The parents have had frequent meetings with his teachers, principal, etc. They've even considered putting him into a school for children with special needs. Nicholas is afraid of the dark, ghosts, monsters, and often will wake up with nightmares. He is also claustrophobic and always wants the door to his room open. He is also very sensitive to noise and becomes startled very easily. Nicholas desires sweets, salty food, smoked meats, and carbohydrates. He tends to be a picky eater when it comes to vegetables. His mom says that he pretty much eats only carrots and cucumbers. He also has a strong aversion to eggs. Nicholas tends to be on the warm side and prefer to go out during the winter with minimal clothing. He will also throw off the kiss covers when sleeping. Okay. So that's the case. Hopefully uh, people could hear that. So are there any suggestions or thoughts? You can type them into the questions field on, on the control panel on the right-hand side if you have any thoughts or suggestions on symptoms. It doesn't have to be a remedy. You know, the most important thing is, first thing to do is to identify those symptoms which you think are important in the case, which the symptoms that whatever remedy you give you know, that remedy should have those symptoms as part of its overall picture. Penny, you can hear me, right? Yeah, I'm fine. 
Okay, good. So any thoughts, any suggestions on important symptoms or themes or, you know, what, 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 what symptoms would you want the remedy to have in it? Any ideas? You got a British oh. audience here, Kim. <laughs> all right, all right. I got no, this one coming in now. Okay, here we go. Okay, so one person suggests aggression and fear. And yeah, that's a good good suggestion. Aggression and fear are two important themes. And there's a number of remedies that you could think of that would be both violent and fearful. Uh, so, for example, stramonium is one that comes to my mind right off the top of the top of the bat, right, where you would have both fear and violence. Uh, and another person suggests attention seeking is is core to the case. And yes, I agree. This person seems to need and want to be the center of attention. So, whatever remedy you give, uh, they need to be the center of attention. It's not just that they they have afraid of being alone. Yes, they do have afraid of being alone but they also need to be watched on top of it. So that's important. Fear of being alone is very good. Um, so all excellent suggestions. Uh, does anybody have a, a suggestion for a remedy or remedies? Any thoughts for remedies? Yes, yeah, somebody here said smoked, desire for smoked foods. And there's a number of different food desires here. Uh, but most of them are fairly common, you know, sweets and salt and carbs. Those are pretty common. But smoked meats is is more unusual. Um, so I would certainly pay attention to that. And that might make me think of the remedy tuberculinum um, for somebody who's violent and who rolls their their head while they're sleeping from side to side, which is, of course, a big keynote of remedies like uh, belladonna and stramonium and tuberculinum. So the rolling of the head with the combination of desire for smoked meats might make me, and the violent behavior might make me think of tuberculinum. Somebody says that he's also insecure and that he seeks approval, and that's absolutely the case. So that's very true. Uh, so contrast between ag aggression and, and lack of self-confidence. Yes, I agree. That's very true. So these are all excellent suggestions. Uh, and there have been two people who have suggested the remedy that was prescribed. So very good for those two individuals who made the, the teeth grinding. Yeah, I think that's very interesting as well. There's a third suggestion of a remedy, also the remedy that was prescribed. Um, so very good. So three people uh, suggested the remedy uh, gallicum acidum. And yes, that is the remedy that I prescribed in this case. Uh, people could have very easily have suggested a remedy like stramonium or tuberculinum. There's there's certain indications uh, for those, or belladonna for that matter, and there's certainly indications. But overall, the best choice in this particular instance is the remedy gallicum acidum. Uh, let me just show you the repertorization of the case. So I've, I've already saved this case in my MIC repertory software. So I'm just going to pull the case up. I saved it under my patients, and I'm just going to pull up the rubrics. And you can see I, I chose more rubrics than I normally would, but just so you can see some of the important rubrics for this particular case. So you've got abusive insulting, uh, abusive insulting even to his best friends, anxiety being alone, anxiety being alone, desires to be watched. There's only one remedy in that rubric, which is gallicum acidum, a desire for company, Desire for company aggravated when alone. Again, the uh, desire for company desires to be watched constantly. Cursing and swearing. Uh, delirium at night. Fear of being alone. Fear of the dark. Jealousy, which is an important characteristic that came out in the case quite strongly. Quarrelsome, a scolding from jealousy. Rudeness. And then here you've got the uh, head, rolling of the head. Profuse perspiration at night and the desire for smoked meats, and lo by far and away the only remedy that runs through all of those rubrics is gallicum acidum. No remedy comes even close. The second one in the list is lycopodium, and you can see that it's missing from a lot of the very important symptoms. So this is a clear case where gallicum acidum is the best indicated remedy and comes out very clearly 
in the repertorization. Let's go ahead. Yeah, did you have a comment, somebody? Penny, you want to say something? Um, let's go ahead and just look at galicamacin as a remedy because it's one that's uh, being prescribed more and more in practice. Uh, somebody has a comment here? Yeah, so somebody asked about miasms. That's a that's a, um, a really loaded question because the problem is that um, depending on how you define miasm, I would have to answer that question differently. And the problem is that the way that that term was used by Hahnemann and the way it's def defined in contemporary homeopathy are rather different. So I would have to first of all make that distinction. Uh, and so uh, let let me. If we have time uh, in in a future call, maybe I can delve into the subject of miasms a little bit more deeply. But um, let me just hold off on that question for now. So um, gallicum acidum, as you can see here, is uh, basically this little bulb that grows on a tree. It's uh, the the insect, uh, like a mosquito, will inject its larvae into the tree, and then it will grow this kind of bulb called a gall nut, and that's the inside is where we get the gallicum acidum. Now, I wanted to talk a little bit about just the study of materia medica and generally, especially as it relates to smaller remedies. And I want to use the example of Herring's um, method called the diagnostic method. He wrote an article called the study of materia medica, and he described this particular approach to studying our remedies called Herring's diagnostic method. And he writes that in order to acquire a foreign language, what good would it do to learn the dictionary from beginning to end. He's saying, you know, you can't learn a language by just starting at the beginning of a dictionary and starting from the beginning and go, going all the way through it. He says that the best way to learn our materia medica is to become the master of a few medicines and to always compare those few medicines with new ones that you study. So you start with a few, you master those, and then when you add new remedies, you study those new remedies in comparison with the remedies that you already know. And the reason that you do that is because it's really hard to memorize long lists of information. The best way to remember something is by comparing what you know uh, with something uh, new that you're trying to learn. So let me give you an example of this. Let's say I've got a case of black vomit with putrid involuntary stools, with much thirst and restlessness, black tongue, great debility, and averse to being covered. So black vomit, putrid involuntary stools, much thirst, restlessness, uh, anxiety, black tongue, great debility, averse to being covered. Now, I think for most of you out there, uh, when I read this description, you'll, the remedy you'll think of is the remedy arsenicum which, by the way, is an acid and contains uh, many symptoms which are similar to other acid remedies. It's actually the most well-represented of our acid remedies. So if you look at these symptoms, they fit arsenicum very, very well, okay? Um, and you can see here, arsenicum comes up number one in this repertorization. But if I change it to averse to being covered, if I don't have this, averse to being covered, then it's arsenicum. But as soon as I ha add averse to being covered, it's no longer arsenicum. It's now sicali. And it's much easier for me to remember sicali as that remedy that had all those symptoms which are similar to arsenicum, but instead of being chilly and wanting to throw off the covers, is actually hot and wants to keep the covers on. So here you can see the mosquito, and it will inject its larvae into the tree and form this little gall note. And this has been used, actually, as a, they use it on the skin for all kinds of different skin issues, including eczema, psoriasis, dermatitis, and even acne and dry skin. And it's also been used for bleeding as well. So there is a strong hemorrhagic diathesis in the remedy gallicum acidum. It's not quite as strong as what you'll see in a remedy like sulfuricum acidum, which has a very strong tendency towards bleeding, or even nitricum acidum, which also has a tendency towards bleeding. But after sulfuricum acidum and nitricum acidum, gallicum acidum would be the acid which tends to have the most amount of bleeding found in it. The original proving of gallicum acidum was conducted in 1872, and here's the symptom from which we get a lot of our mental and understanding of the mental and emotional picture of the remedy. Wild delirium at night, 
talks strangely, is very restless, jumps out of bed, swears profusely, is afraid to be left alone, insists upon constantly being watched, is exceedingly rude and abuses everyone, even his best friends, is jealous of his nurse and curses everyone who speaks to her. And this symptom, which came out very strongly in the proving, is the symptom from which we will get a lot of our understanding of this remedy. Now, this is a remedy that affects the mind very, very strongly. It also affects the digestive organs, the respiratory system, the urinary system, the mucous membranes, and also the skin. But really, its primary effect is on the mental plane. And you'll see that it's become a remedy that we commonly give in for children or for adolescents. One of the primary feelings that you'll see in Gallicum acidum is a fear or feeling of being abandoned. And these patients will insist tremendously, they will have this desire to constantly be watched, to make sure that there's someone always around, that they feel frightened if there isn't somebody around to watch them. So it's a, it's a feeling of being afraid, of being abandoned, of feeling forsaken, of being left alone, and needing somebody to be around to watch you to feel secure. And if you don't have that person around, if there isn't somebody in the other room to be there, to be present, then you start to go into a state of panic. It's similar to what you will find in arsenicum, except in arsenicum, it's fine for the person to be in the other room. As long as they know that that person's in the other room, it's fine. Here, they actually need to be watched. They need to have the door open so they can see that that person is in the other room watching them and they know that they're not alone. It's a tremendous fear of being alone. It's comparable to the fear of being alone that you would find in remedies like arsenicum or phosphorus or bismus subnitricum or hepar sulfuricum, where they have tremendous fear of being alone. Now, this fear, this whole state that you find in Gallicum acidum will come on for a variety of different reasons, but usually it's some type of sudden shock that will precipitate the Gallicum acidum state in individuals who are susceptible to going into the state. So just because you've had one of these types of shocks doesn't mean that you necessarily need Gallicum acidum. It, needs, it requires the combination of the shock and the susceptibility to going into this type of state. One of the primary etiological factors to go, for somebody to go into a Gallicum acidum state is the divorce of the parents. So the parents get divorced, the child feels this tremendous shock, the child feels now that they're their life is now in an insecure situation. Who are they going to live with? Will it be the mom? Will it be the dad? Where, what's going to happen then? Where are they going to go? And this sense of shock creates a feeling of insecurity and in some individuals leads to a Gallicum acidum state. The birth of a, a, a sister, a, a brother or a sister, a new sibling, can also precipitate a Gallicum acidum state. You can imagine the child has been there alone. They've had all the attention of the mother or father. Now a new child comes along, a baby's brother or sister. The attention is taken away from them. And for those individuals who are susceptible, they could go into a Gallicum Massum state. Some may go into a hyoscyama state, some may go into a stramonium state, some may go into a lacus state. Depends on the susceptibility of each individual, uh, but some of them could potentially go into a gallicum acidum state. And in this state, they will demand and want to be the center of attention. That's the key. They need, and that's why you saw that child talking over the parents, because they didn't, they couldn't even accept that I would be talking to the parents and anybody would be giving attention to anybody other than the child themselves. Now, these individuals tend to be both manipulative and jealous. They're jealous, they want this to be the center of attention, they want everything to be about them, and they're manipulative and they will do anything they can to, to get to be the center of attention. So they will do all kinds of different things to manipulate, to cheat, so that they become the center of attention. This is why you see it in the famous proving symptom, jealous of his nurse and curses everyone who speaks to her. He wants or she wants the attention of the nurse completely. She doesn't want the nurse to pay attention to anybody else, and they will curse and scream at anybody to whom the nurse pays attention. 
And this is a remedy that can become quite violent and extremely aggressive. You will think of remedies like stramonium, like tuberculinum, like hyoscyamus, like thoracium album, like anacardium, like kepar sulfuricum, remedies that have a tendency towards tremendous violence and aggression. You will see the violence and aggression even in their facial expressions. Sometimes you'll see this very angular jaw, very stiff that you can see, you can actually see them holding in the anger and the aggression right in their facial mannerisms. These are people who have a tremendous amount of pent up anger and hostility. And you will see the aggressiveness even in the way, the angular way in which they move their jaws. You will see that there, there's all this pent up aggression and hostility. And even in the way that they hold their face, you'll see this tense, aggressive stance that's full of anger and, and, and violence. And these are people who will explode out of anger and violence when they're not getting the attention that they need or if they're not getting what they want in life or they feel that they're not uh, being given the necessary uh, focus and attention from others, they can explode in a state of violence. They will actually completely lose control and become extremely destructive and also malicious. Not just a violence where they explode and get angry, they will actually become destructive and malicious like you would see in remedies like Hepar sulfuricum or Veratrum album or tuberculinum where they will actually intentional or anacardium where they will intentionally cause malicious intent towards another person. They will bite, they will strike, they will kick, they will curse and they will destroy things. And they will throw temper tantrums when they're not allowed to do something that they want. And as a consequence, these are the type of children who will easily embarrass their parents because they're always throwing temper tantrums to be the center of attention. These are the, uh, the babies who will, I don't know if you can see this video here or not. Well, I guess this video is not working, but baby, uh, this, you will see that these will be babies who will be extremely violent. So it's in the rubric uh, uh, for uh, child babies, infants who will kick and bite on waking. That's the level of violence that you see in this remedy. You also see as they become uh, older, you see lots of rudeness, people who are abusive towards other people, even abusive towards their close friends and family members. Now, gallicum acidum can also appear to be very sweet uh, in front of strangers and very nice. And the reason that you'll see this type of behavior is that they can be, remember, very manipulative and they can be, they want to be the center of attention. So they know, they've learned that they can act a certain way so they can still get to be the center of attention and get what they want. Although eventually their uh, malicious, angry, temperamental behavior will come out after a period of time. These are people who will oftentimes, again, they'll lie, they'll cheat, they'll be manipulative, they'll do bad things, and oftentimes they will deny it. Again, they want to be the center of attention, and they will uh, cheat and lie so they don't get caught doing bad things. So just to summarize, these are people who will be unrestrained, insolent, rash, violent, and manipulative. And you'll see it's in rubrics like audacity, audacity in children, biting, cursing, destructiveness, jealousy, mischievousness in children, rudeness, and striking. They can also be very compulsive. And so you'll think of remedies like tuberculinum and metarinum and stramonium, which are all remedies, Vratrum album, which can also have exhibit compulsive types of behavior. And again, cheating, lying, stealing, manipulative, they will all do these types of things to get ahead, to get what they want, to be the center of attention. It's a remedy that tends to be quite restless. So you'll think of remedies like tuberculinum or arsenicum or metarinum or, or tarantula that tend to have lots of energy and be very restless. And you'll see this rolling of the head and moaning when they sleep. We saw this in the case where they'll roll their head from left to right and back again. And of course, these are this is a keynote of remedies like belladonna, 
stramonium, tarantula, and tuberculinum, where they'll roll the head back and forth. The infants and the children tend to be quite sleepless. And like tuberculinum, they desire smoked foods. So this is very useful to you, uh, that this is a remedy that will share a number of symptoms with tuberculinum. They have the maliciousness, they have the violence, they have the rolling of the head from left to right, and they have the desire for smoked meats. So if you see that in a case and you're thinking of tuberculinum, you might say, oh, I remember there was a remedy that shared a bunch of tuberculinum symptoms at the rolling of the head, the maliciousness, the uh, desire for smoked meats, uh, the violent behavior, the, the temper tantrums. Actually, if you think about it, gallic acidum kind of looks like a cross between the remedies stramonium and tuberculinum. And this is why I talked about Herring's diagnostic method a little bit earlier. And I said, you know, the best way to study remedies is to study them in comparison with other remedies. One of the reasons that you do that is if you think about it, the way that you analyze a case is you repertorize the case and then you study the remedies that come up in your repertorization. So if you've studied the remedies by comparison, you've already adapted yourself to the process of case analysis because you're already thinking of the remedies by comparing them one to the other. And you can especially see that this is useful when you're looking at a smaller remedy like gallicum acidum because now you can remember it as a remedy that looks like a cross between stramonium and tuberculinum. And if you have a case where you've got a lot of stramonium symptoms and you've got a lot of tuberculinum symptoms, and you'll think, oh, maybe this is a case where gallicum acidum might be indicated. So let's look at how gallic acidum is similar to stramonium. Uh, they're both abusive. They both have biting. They both have a desire for company. Uh, they both have a desire uh, for company, and they're very much aggravated when they're alone. They both tend to be very destructive. They both have a fear of being alone and a fear of the dark. They will jump out of bed and be very afraid and have nightmares. Uh, they'll both be kicking, and they both have that motions at the head where it rolls from side to side. So a number of very important similarities between stramonium and gallicum acidum. Let's look at uh, the similarities between tuberculinum and gallicum acidum. Well, tuberculinum and gallicum acidum are both abusive. They have audacity or audacity in children, the kind of boldness that you see in children. Uh, they have biting. They have cursing. They both have destructiveness. They both have kicking. They both restlessness at night. They both have that motions of the head, the rolling of the head. They both have the profuse perspiration at night, and they both desire smoked meats. So again, you see a lot of similarities between tuberculinum, stramonium, and gallicum acinum. And if you have a case where you're thinking of both tuberculinum and Stramonium, you might also think about the possibility of gallicum asthma, especially if there's this big issue about having being the center of attention and needing to have attention on you uh, and nobody else. Um, I won't go through stramonium right now, but I did want to just briefly talk about the remedy. Uh, and I won't talk about uh, tuberculin method, but I did want to quickly talk about the remedy bismuth subnitricum um, because it's a remedy which also has very strongly this component of um, violence or maliciousness and fear, and, and fear of being alone especially. And so uh, you see this very strongly in stramonium. You won't see it in tuberculinum because in tuberculinum, you don't have that fear element. You have the malicious, violent component but tuberculinum tends to be very courageous and fearless, and so you don't see that fear component. But in bismuth, you see that uh, polarity of violence and fear quite strongly. And so I think it's a remedy that we need to talk about when you're talking about remedies like stramonium uh, and gallicum acidum. Uh, bismuth subnitricum is in stage 15 of the periodic table, along with uh, nitrogen, arsenic, phosphorus, antimony, and it uh, affects the stomach very much like those other remedies as well. It has the, it shares with phosphorus the symptom of uh, desiring cold drinks, and then once they warm up in the stomach, uh, it vomits them back up again. So uh, both phosphorus and bismuth subnitricum have that particular symptom. These are bismuth subnitricum artificial man-made crystals. And here you can see it uh, at the very bottom of stage 15 in the periodic table. This is a remedy that really affects the stomach very strongly. I, um, I mean, 
more than any other area of the body and, and very much affects the stomach. Usually, uh, if business subnitricum is indicated in the case, usually there's some type of stomach problem. Think about um, uh, Pepto-Bismol, right? And it causes this very intense stomach pain, which results in tremendous turmoil and restlessness. And so it can confuse you with gallic amacidum, which is also a very restless remedy. But one of the differentiating features is that in bismuth, the pain is going to be much stronger and it's going to be much more centered in the stomach. Uh, gallic amacidum, you wouldn't see such intense pain focused in the stomach uh, and you wouldn't see um, uh, the fear of being alone being the result of being in pain as much as the fear of some type of insecurity as the result of the divorce of the parents or the a new sibling or something new, you know, maybe the, the loss of a home or moving to a new environment or something along those lines, which would precipitate this sense of insecurity, which would lead to the gallic amassum state. Whereas in business of Nitricum, really it's, it's the, the fear of being alone because you're in such terrible pain and you need somebody around because you're afraid. That's really what it is in bismuth. Also, as I mentioned earlier, you've got this interesting combination of desire for cold water, which once it warms up in the stomach is vomited back up again, like we see in phosphorus. That's not something you'd see in gallic amacidum. In business subnitricum, you've got a want of moral feeling, this tendency towards being cruel or indifferent to others. It reminds you a lot of remedies like anacardium or hepar sulfuricum or maybe anacardium, where this type of cruelty or lack of moral feeling, uh, really, um, really, in Secuta Verosa has this as well, kind of in, inability to, to feel others, uh, feeling any compassion towards other people. And with the pain and this lack of moral feeling and this maliciousness, you see this tremendous clinginess uh, out of uh, fear uh, or pain. So again, violence and fear of being alone or clinginess, which makes you think of stramonium, will also make you think of bismuth subnitricum as well. So fear of being alone, insecurity, they, they don't want to be left alone. And like gallicum acidum uh, and stramonium and tuberculinum and remedies of that nature, this is a remedy that can have very strong temper tantrums. So again, this is another reason that you could confuse it with gallicum acidum. But again, the difference will be that in gallicum acidum, uh, the, the precipitating factor will be this, the pain uh, primarily around the stomach area. These are some of the major features uh, that you'll find in a remedy like bismuth somnitricum. Okay. All right, um, Penny, are there any questions? Or I can look and see if there's any questions. I did have another case, but there really isn't time to present another case and another remedy. So I can save that for next time. But are there any questions about uh, the case that I presented or any questions about anything that I presented for that matter? Or any comments? Kim, perhaps people might like to um, put a few questions. If we're doing another few, another session tomorrow night, then um, perhaps they can they can also let us know here, or they can email me in between. Uh, sure. So I, that, that's, I think I know all of the people on the list, so they can give me a, a, an email if there's anything else that they want to particularly address, um, and anything else they'd like you to do. It's been a lovely presentation on gallic acid for sure. Sure. Well, yeah, I'd be happy to, whatever, whatever you'd like. Yeah. I mean, and you know, we can, I'm whatever serves people on the call, I'm happy to do. So, you know, whatever people want, it's fine. Okay. Any questions? Well, yeah. So they send you <laughs> questions next time. Next time I can just answer them uh, for okay. the call. Yeah. And, and perhaps some um, people can let us know as well if they want us to show them any way that they can study some of these uh, remedies on, on, on their own using MathRef and reference works. And um, that might be helpful for people as well. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I can, and I can even show you how to use some aspects mm. of the program to pull out information as yeah. well, for sure. Um, it looks like Delney's got a comment there. Yeah, somebody said something about um, interesting case, but I'm not getting a feel for the acid characteristics. You know, it's very hard with gallicum acidum because it really doesn't have 
the striking characteristics that you find in a lot of the other acid remedies. There's a few acids out there like floricum acidum and uh, floricum acidum and gallicum acidum, which really don't look like the other acids. Uh, even benzoicum acidum doesn't really, uh, although it does share with nitricum acidum the smell like horse's urine. But aside from that, it doesn't really... Uh, so it's very hard. As I said at the beginning, a lot of times with these groups, I can tell you, yeah, they tend to have, you know, thin discharges and weakness, but it's it's really hard with a, a group like acids to necessarily identify them as a grouping. Hmm. Perhaps we can show them how to how to search on MacRep and, and, and find yeah. out what are those yeah. common symptoms so that then they can study and research for themselves and find out what are the themes of any group. Yeah. Totally, yeah, we can do that for sure. Great. All right. Oh, well, listen, um, I want to wish everybody a very good evening and uh, look forward to our call tomorrow. Good. Okay. Thanks very much, Kim. Have a, have a good night, everybody. Okay. Bye now. Bye-bye.